good day to you, Covenant Church. Hey, Covenant Carrollton, help me welcome all of our campuses, Crossroads, McKinney, <laughs> Colleyville, all those online. Love, love, love you. So glad you're here with us today. We are starting a new series, and just in a moment, we're gonna go local to each campus. Some of the greatest communicators on the planet are gonna bring the word today for you here and at each campus, so get ready for that. But how many know it's important for us to know where we're planted and be intentional about where we plant ourselves? Whether you're intentional or not, do you know you are planted somewhere? And we, we are called to bear fruit. I wanna bear good fruit, right? You wanna bear good fruit. But the, the seed and the soil, right, the location you're planted in has everything to do with the kind of fruit you're gonna produce. Years ago, my wife and I were in Northern California and we had a chance to see the, the beautiful sequoia trees. How many of you love trees? I mean, gorgeous. How many know that not all trees in California will survive in Texas? For one poor sequoia tree, there were some Texans touring and bought one. We thought, we could bring the sequoia tree home. We wanna have it in our backyard. And unfortunately for that sequoia tree, uh, heaven now has one more tree in it than it did before. But we realized not only can maybe the, the heat of Texas kill this poor little tree because us Texan visitors bought it, right, and brought it home, but also we, we planted this massive tree with great aspiration and potential. I mean, this sequoia tree could, could have grown to be 100 feet tall. I bet as a young sequoia sapling, he thought, man, I, one day I'm gonna be casting so much shade, you don't even know. And then here came, come the hazes, right? We bought this poor tree, we ruined his dreams. We brought him to Texas and we planted him in a pot in the backyard. How many know not only was the heat an issue, but it, it's limiting, li, limiting to, to plant a tree with great potential in a small pot. It never could have grown to its full potential because of where it was planted. It's important for you to know where you're planted, but also many of the issues we face in life. We're gonna cover in the next three weeks in this series about, about the root causes to issues. How many know the Bible isn't the root cause to your issues, but it is the root cause to every answer to your issues? And when you're planted in the house of God and you're planted in his word, Psalms 1, chapter 1, verse 3 says that he who is planted by streams of water flourishes and bears fruit in season and is successful in everything that they do. It's important to know when you're planted in God's word, you're gonna not just bear fruit, you're gonna bear good fruit. But many of us look to the issues of life like anger and depression and unforgiveness as the issue, but that's not actually the root to the issue. In this series, we're gonna help you locate what the root cause is, and, and I believe through his word, find the root answers, amen? How many are ready to find some answers to life's issues, problems? No more, we're not planted in the world and in his house. We wanna be just planted in God's word, amen? Come on, let's pray and we'll go local. Father, we thank you this day, God. We thank you for the incredible chance we have to go to your word and find all the answers we need for anything we could face in this life. God, we know that if we're looking for answers to our questions, you are the one who holds all the answers. God, thank you for being the answer for us, no matter what the question is today and every day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Come on, would you help me welcome each communicator to every campus to the stage right now? Come on, show some honor. We're honors due. I love you. We'll see you soon. Well, good morning again. It's great to see everybody. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever been offended? Have you ever had somebody to do something, say something that really got you set off? I'm reminded of a story. This is a true story of one of my friends. It was a road rage, a road rage incident. He's driving down 121, and some guy pulls over and just hits the brakes. And he was having a very bad day. And the next thing you know, that now they're in this encounter where he's now darting out, going up as he passed the guy, shaking his fist, saying some choice words, maybe releasing a certain finger. And he pulls in front of the guy and he hits his brake. And they go down the interstate and they're just back and forth, jockeying on the road. And, and my friend was so frustrated that, that he was thinking to himself, what do I have? I'm going to throw something at him. And at that time, his car was having some oil leak issues, so he had a quart of Quaker State oil uh, on his front seat. And so he let his window down, and next time that guy came on side and he's jawing at him, he just took that can and just, off, I mean, just hit the car. And he said it sounded like a cannon had gone off. And he said, and it so shook the other guy in the car, he hit the gas and he, I mean, just went right on down the interstate because he thought maybe he was being shot at. And then my, my friend was thinking to himself, he says, man, I'm going to go to jail today. So the next exit, he just exited very quickly, hoping that this guy didn't see him and see where he went. 
And at the end of the day, my friend was telling me, man, he says, I had no idea that I could get so mad and things were so inside internalized in me that I would do something that stupid. You see, what happened, he had something going on in his life that had become a deep-seated root, and he didn't even know. And all it takes is the right moment, the right situation, the right time, the right context for whatever is deep inside of us to come out if we're carrying an offense. Jesus talks about how we respond to offenses in the 17th chapter of the book of Luke. He's talking about the dynamics of the kingdom and how the kingdom works. And he talked about that if we're going to receive the things of the kingdom, then we have to come as little children. We have to come with meekness. We have to come with humility. We have to come with this innocence. And we pick up in verse 1 of chapter 17 of the book of Luke. Then he said to his disciples, it is impossible that no offenses should come. But woe to him through whom they do come. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea than that he should offend one of these little ones. Take heed to yourselves. If your brother sins against you, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in a day, and seven times in a day returns to you saying, I repent, you shall forgive him. And the apostle said to the Lord, increase our faith. So the Lord said, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you can say to the mulberry tree, and there are other uh, translations that says sycamore or sycamine tree, If you have faith as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be pulled up by the roots and be planted in the sea and it will obey you. So we're going to talk about this today and we're going to evaluate whether or not you might have an offense that has led to unforgiveness, which then leads to a root of bitterness in your heart. And here's the first thought that I have about offenses is offenses will come. It's impossible for us to live life without having an offense. And they're coming. They're going to come because we have relationships. Maybe you were offended by something your dad did or didn't do way back when. Maybe you were offended by something a spouse said or something they did. Maybe you were offended by the kids or the kids offended by you. It could be any of those things. It could be your neighbor who maybe waters his yard on the wrong day and the water drains off into your place and creates hazardous conditions. Maybe it's a coworker who gets on your last nerve and they've been getting on your last nerve for so many years that now they are dead to you. Maybe it's a boss. I don't know. Maybe it's a system. Maybe it's culture. Maybe it's society. The reality is the offenses are going to come. There's nothing we can do about those. So let's look at this word offense. In the Greek, the word offense is the word scandalon. Scandalon. And in its original meaning, it meant this, to spring forward and back. It meant this, to slam to. And in fact, the nouns that that are brought together out of this word, uh, we get this word scandal or scandalous from this word scandalon. And these words brought together, they denote a means by which something closes. So I want you to imagine for a moment a trap. Now, I grew up in the country, and uh, we, we wanted to catch rabbits. We wanted to have a pet wild rabbit. How many of y'all know that's an oxymoron? You can't have a pet wild rabbit. But we used to catch them. My grandfather had these little wire cages, and, and here's what happened. The cage itself was not considered the scandalon. It was not the, the, the mechanism that would trap you. So here's how it would work. We would set the trap door, and the door would be at an angle, and then the rabbit would come in there, and there was a little plate at the bottom that had a little thin wire connected to it. And the minute the rabbit stepped on the plate, it tipped the wire, and the wire was holding the door open, so then the door would shut. So now the rabbit's caught. It wasn't the trap that caught him. It was the trigger mechanism that caught him. And that's the scandal on. So every trap has a triggering mechanism and that, that, and, and its intent is to snare you. It's to catch you. You see, offenses will come and there are things in our lives that if we're not careful, they, we can set the snare that then puts us in a trap, but we don't have to. We don't have to live in that place that when offenses come, you don't have to be trapped by them. You can escape from every offense. And that's what we're going to talk about today. 
So the offense comes and forgiveness sets in. But can I say this to you, that it's not easy to forgive. I'm going to give you just a couple of reasons why it's not easy to forgive. It might be a whole bunch of others, but here's one of the reasons uh, why it's not easy to forgive. Number one, when you've been offended and there's been pain that's gone very deeply, you can be emotionally drained by it. You had somebody that you shared your heart with and you told them the uh, intimate secrets of your heart and you did life together and all of a sudden something happened and they offended you. They said something wrong. They did something wrong. They broke a promise. They they, uh, violated a confidence. And at the end of the day, you have been so emotionally hurt that you don't have the strength to forgive because the pain is so deep. The psalmist understood this in Psalms, the 41st chapter, verse 9. This is the message translation. We read, even my best friend, the one I always told everything, he ate meals at my house all the time, has bitten my hand. Anybody been in that situation where somebody you absolutely put your trust in, you put your confidence in, you were friends, you were best buds, you were all that in a bag of chips, and then they just did something that just ruined the relationship? That takes an emotional toll, and that makes it very difficult for you to forgive. Here's the the second thing, why it's difficult to forgive. Because sometimes when you harbor that pain, that emotion, it feels comfortable to you. You see, God's given us emotions. Emotions to be sad, to be happy, to be glad, to be mad, to be uh, high, to be low. All of those emotions, to, to feel confused, to feel dead, whatever it is, he gave them to us. But here's what he never intended. He never intended for emotions to rule us. He intended that in the right moment, these emotions would surface. But they have their purpose when they are under control. And so sometimes we don't forgive people because it just feels good to be mad at them. You understand what I'm saying? See, I remember the season I went through when my first wife was killed by a drunk driver. And, and it was amazing. The, the people would come up to me and they would pat me on the shoulder and they said, Oh, poor thing. I can't believe this, that you're 33 years old and you're a widower. This shouldn't have happened to you. And let me tell you, when people would come and they'd say, and they were consoling me, it felt really good. And it's almost as if I put put on that coat of self-pity, because that's what people were doing. They were pitying me. And then I got to a point where I began to say, oh, yeah, poor me. Oh, I just feel so sad about the situation I'm in. I shouldn't be here. I'm so pitiful. I can't believe that at 33 years old, I'm a widower. And you know what? I began to put that coat of self-pity on. And then one day in my prayer time, my quiet time, I felt the Lord say to me, hey, that coat's pretty comfortable, isn't it? I said, yeah, it is. He says, you can't continue to wear it. He says, what will happen is this coat that provides such comfort to you now, one day it will become a weight to you. And it will hinder you from moving to this next phase, to this next level, to this next journey, this next season that I'm calling you to. And so when we get offended, sometimes it feels good to just be mad at them. Sometimes it feels good to to not take their phone call or to see them walking in the grocery store and you turn your head even as you go down the aisle. You actually went down the same aisle on purpose, but you just wanted to be ugly. You wanted them to know that you're going to be ugly because you're still mad. You're still offended at them. And so you put on that comfortable coat and you wear it like a garment. That's why it makes it difficult sometimes that to, to, uh, to release the offense and to, to walk in forgiveness. But let me just tell you something. Offenses and carrying a defense, it's very dangerous. There's three things. Three things that carrying an offense will do if you don't deal with it. Offenses not dealt with will steal your peace. It'll steal your peace. There's a story that Jesus talks about in Matthew, the 18th chapter. There's a king. He has servants. They owe him a lot of money. And they're one. I'm going to call him servant number one. He came to the king. The king said, hey, it's time to pay up your debt. And the guy said, oh, king, I'm doing everything I can. I'm going to pay the debt. It was like tens of millions of dollars. It was a huge sum that this guy could never pay ever in his lifetime. And so the king says, I don't want to hear all of that. I've given you enough time. You're going to jail. Your wife's going to jail. Your family's going to jail. So what the king was saying, man, this debt here is going to destroy your relationships and your legacy. 
And he starts begging to the king. He starts pleading, oh, king, have mercy upon me. Come on, king, give me another chance. I promise you I'll get this resolved. And he begged and he pleaded, and the king said to him, okay, okay. All right, I don't, I don't really need the money, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to release you. And the guy went out, and man, I mean, he's, he's wiping the sweat off of his brow. And as he's walking down the street, he sees another guy who owes him money. So that's servant number two, owes servant number one money, but it's only a thousand bucks. And he says to servant number two, hey, I need my money, and I need my money now. He was like Mr. Krabs, you know, me money, me money. And the guy says, oh, please have mercy upon me. I promise you I'm going to do my best. I'm doing everything that I can. I'm trying to, you know, make things work so I can help him. And the guy says, no, absolutely not. You give me my money now or you're going to jail. Your wife's going to jail. Your family's going to jail. And the guy said, no, please don't do it. Don't do it. Servant number one sends servant number two to jail. Then a whole bunch of people went to the king and they said, hey, king, did you know that guy that you forgave tens of millions of dollars of debt? He just had a guy who owed him a thousand bucks put in prison. King was royally ticked off. And we pick up the story, Matthew, the 18th chapter, verse 33. Here's what the king says. Should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant just as I had pity on you? And his master was angry and delivered him to the torturers. Everybody say torturers until he should pay all that was due him. This is why I'm telling you, an offense not dealt with, it will torture you. It will steal your peace. Why? Because the offense, the event, it's rehearsed over and over and over in your mind. The words, the experience, it, and it brings you to a place of, of, of one of these two extremes. It brings you to a place of being boiling mad because of what happened or depressingly sad, and everything in between. But if you don't deal with an offense, it'll steal your peace. Here's the second thing, that if you don't deal with a, an offense, it will steal your health. It will steal your health. According to Dr. Stephen Sandiford, who is the chief of surgery at Cancer Centers, uh, Treatment Centers of America, he says, refusing to forgive makes people sick and keeps them that way. And he was saying that based upon a study that uh, all the people that they were treating, the ones who harbored some sort of offense, some sort of unforgiveness in their heart, that they did not respond to the treatment as well as those who had no issues, who had a clear heart and a clear mind. In fact, here's the reality. Harboring, harboring negative emotions creates a state of chronic anxiety. And you know what happened when you are in a place of chronic anxiety? Your body begins to produce adrenaline at a, at a constant rate, and it also uh, produces cortisol. And guess what adrenaline and cor cortisol continue to be reproduced in your body does? It begins to inhibit those cells that are designed to be the primary defenders, the gatekeepers to stop disease from coming into your body. You see, if you don't deal with an offense, it will steal your peace it will steal your health. It'll take a mental and an emotional toll upon you. If you don't deal with an offense, guess what else it'll steal? It will steal your heart, and it will become a root of bitterness. It'll become a root of bitterness. In Deuteronomy, the 28th chapter, the Lord, when he's communing with the nation of Israel and the children of Israel, he's laid out what we call the blessings. God says, if you'll do this, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to prosper you. Your family is going to be healthy. You're going to have good houses. The crops are all going to be successful. The pestilence won't come. And everything that you touch is going to turn to gold. And then he said this, so he added the blessing, but then he said, but if you don't do this, here's the corresponding result. So it was the blessing and the curse. He put those out, the benefits and the challenges. And then he goes on to say this in verse 18 of Deuteronomy, the 29th chapter. He says, I'm making this covenant with you so that no one among you, no man, woman, clan, or tribe will turn away from the Lord, our God, to worship these gods of other nations. So he said, I'm making an agreement with you because I want you to understand what it means to be in relationship with me. And I want you to know that there's benefits. I'm not mean, but there is a corresponding benefit, like gravity. If I jump off this stage, I'm hitting the ground. Is gravity bad? 
If I get on a six-story building and I jump over it, is gravity bad? No, it's just a law that's in place, and there's a corresponding action to violating the law. So that's what he was saying. And then he goes on to say this, and so that no root among you bears bitter and poisonous fruit. I'm making this covenant so you don't turn away from God. I'm making this covenant so no bitter, poisonous root will rise up in you. I'm giving you the keys to success. I'm giving you the tools. Verse 19, those who hear the warnings of this curse should not congratulate themselves thinking I am safe even though I am following the desires of my own stubborn heart, this would lead to utter ruin. So God was saying, don't say that when you've heard what I said, I will do it. You've heard the corresponding bad thing that could happen when you don't live according to the rules. He says, don't walk around thinking that, man, you're going to be good. Because the rules are going to, to do what they do, like fire. Is fire bad? No. Can fire do bad things? Absolutely. When it is out of control and it's out of the confines of what you've intended, then fire is very dangerous. But fire warms us up. Fire cooks our food. It's very good under a controlled situation. So what is this root that bears bitter fruit that he's talking about here in Deuteronomy? And what is the root that bears the bitter fruit of unforgiveness and offense? Here's the root, pride and presumption. Pride is why when we have an offense and it leads to unforgiveness and eventually becomes a bitter root, we have pride that stands in the way and we have presumption. Why? Because when we look at what we just read, he says, don't think to yourself that I'm good. See, pride will cause you to believe that you're better than you really are or that you're more than you really are. In fact, the scripture says this, to not Think of yourself more highly than you ought to think. It didn't say don't have a good self-esteem, but basically what, what the Scripture teaches us is know your limitations. Know what you're good at. Know what you're not good at. Don't think you're really good at something and you really aren't. Don't think that you've got a handle on a thing when you really don't. That's pride. And so when we have an offense, pride jumps in. And then what is the presumption? He says this, don't think because you're disobeying the rule and the stubbornness of your heart that there's not correction coming. That's a presumption. I can do wrong, but I'm going to be good. It's no different than in our household. Sid and I have set aside uh, our, our created standards of what I'm going to say behavior, their expectations. And when they were young, when they got out of alignment, there was correction. But was the correction designed to destroy them? No, the correction was designed to bring them back into alignment so that they could prosper, so they could be in health. It's like the lines on the highway that you're going to drive on today. If there were no lines, if there were no yellow lines and no uh, white lines and no, no uh, divided lines and no straight lines, it would be chaos on the highway. And so when we have this root of unforgiveness, Created by the offense, and that unforgiveness leads to a root of bitterness. The root cause of all of that is pride and presumption. I'm going to walk in unforgiveness, and I'm going to be good, absolutely. You're going to have your peace stolen, you're going to have your health stolen, and you're going to have your heart stolen. So what is this root of unforgiveness and this offense? It's, it's pride. So how do we get free? We go right back to this passage of Scripture, Luke, the 17th chapter, Verse 3, and here's what, here's what Jesus said. Number one, he says this, how do we get free? Take heed to yourself. Verse 3, take heed to yourself. In other words, he was saying, look at you. See, I know that daddy might have promised you things and maybe he abandoned you. One of the greatest challenges we have in this nation is what we call the father wounding. So many dads have been so irresponsible. They've not affirmed their daughters. They've not taught their young men how to be men. And lots of people have things that are happening in their lives and they're like that guy who took the oil can and threw it at the car. They're acting out in ways that they can't believe they're doing this, but it's because they're hurt, because they have an offense, because they're wounded in some kind of way. But here's what Jesus says. You can't blame anybody for how you're responding. Take heed to yourself. In our marriage ministry, we say this. Draw a circle around yourself and fix what's in the circle. It's not your spouse that is the issue. It's you. You have to own your behavior. You have to own your attitude. You have to own how you react to the offense when it comes. Take heed to yourself. 
If your brother sins against you, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in a day and seven times in a day returns to you saying, I repent, you shall forgive him. And the apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. Now, why would they say increase our faith? They said increase our faith because they lived in a culture where the standard, the rule, was an eye for an eye. You poke my eye out, I poke your eye out. You cut my hand off, I cut your hand off. You sleep with my wife, I sleep with your wife. You kill my cow, I kill your cow. That was the standard. So when Jesus is saying, man, when they come and all they do is repent, you got to let them go. They're like, no, we want justice. So why did they say increase our faith? Because this standard that Jesus was establishing was so foreign to them. And then he says, so the Lord said, if you have faith as a mustard seed, a little tiny deal. Don't need a lot of faith. You just need just a little. You can say to this sycamore tree, be pulled up by the roots and be planted in the sea, and it would obey you. So the first way that we get free is, number one, we take heed to ourselves. We own it. We own our attitude. We own our behavior. We own our action or reaction or response to the offense when it came, and we don't let unforgiveness come in. Number two, how do we get free? It takes faith to forgive. This is why they're saying, this is beyond us, so I need help. Maybe you're in a situation where this thing has gnawed at you for so long, and it's got a root, and it's hard for you to forgive. Somebody asked me in after the first service this morning, well, you know, my dad and I, we're restoring our relationship, and I've hated him most of my life. He calls me now. Do I have to respond to him? I've forgiven him, but I don't want anything to do with him. And here's what I said to the person. Well, perhaps the Lord is is having him call you. So here's what I would do. I'd pick up the phone. Yes, it's going to be hard. Yes, it's going to be difficult. Yes, there might be still feelings there. You, You can forgive a person and still have the memory, still have the pain, all of that. It's a process. And I said, so so don't get in the way of what God's trying to do because here's the principle that I said to her. Understand this, that there's a law in the earth called sowing and reaping. I said, you don't have any children yet. So do you want your relationship with your child estranged? No, I don't. Well, then you got to make it right with your dad because there's the potential that the seed that's being sown in you all's relationship is going to take root and it's going to come up. So it takes faith to release an offense because here's the reality. When we've been hurt and when we've been emotionally struck down, here's what we say. We want justice. But really what we're saying is we want revenge, right? You don't want justice for the people who ticked you off and hurt you. You want revenge. You say you want the offender to hurt. You want that offender to be in pain because they've inflicted pain upon you. You want them to be punished because what they did to you is hurt you. It's cost you money. It's cost you time. It's cost you uh, uh, energy in your own mind. See, I understand that. So my first wife was killed by a drunk driver. And I say this, you say, Pastor, it happened so long ago. Why are you bringing that up? I know you've been offended by other things. I've never been offended by anything that serious. And I had to make a decision. So from the first night of the accident, I'm sitting in the hospital, police comes and he says, so tell me what happened. I said, you tell me. All I remember is making a left turn. I had a green light and everything went black. And I find my wife in the back seat fighting for her life. And he says, well, this is, we're piecing it together from witnesses. You were going through the light. You're making the left turn. Drunk driver went through the intersection 70 miles an hour. He's, and I said, well, what happened to him? Is he alive? He says, he's down uh, just a few rooms down in the hall, and he's fighting for his life. Fractured, two broken hips, uh, two p- punctured, collapsed lungs. He's in bad shape, not sure if he's going to make it. And you know what I said that night? Oh, I forgive him. Somebody came in the next day, hey, you heard from the guy who hit y'all? No, I haven't. Uh, You know, I don't know who he is, don't know his name, don't know anything about him. I forgive him. And for the next two months, I proceeded to say, I forgive him. Until one Tuesday night, I come into my house, I'm going through the mail, there's a letter from the DA's office. And I open the the letter, and the DA's office says, we have submitted uh, this case to the grand jury to see if there's enough evidence to indict him for vehicular homicide. And we respectfully are sad to tell you and inform you 
that the, the grand jury says there's insufficient evidence to indict him for vehicular homicide. And I screamed at God. I'm telling you, I screamed so loud and I clenched my fist and I said to God, how in the world can they come to this conclusion? This guy has a blood alcohol content level of 0.18 and I have a dead wife. And I bawled. But in that moment, I realized that all that nicety about, oh, I forgive him. Mm-mm. In my heart that night, I saw the rage, rage that could have killed him. And I called my good friend Gordon Banks, and I said, Gordon, you got to get over here, man. I've just gotten this letter, and I'm bawling, and I'm snotting, and I'm crying. And he comes, and he listens to me rant and rave for like a half hour. And then he, with his wisdom and compassion, just basically said, well, he says, you got a choice to make. He says, you can either hold this against him forever, or you can really let him go. He said, because at the end of the day, you and I know that if you hold this, you're going to be the loser in this equation. And that night, with all the strength I could get, he and I prayed, and I said, God, I'm coming to you now, and I release him. I'm letting him go. And you know what I said that night? I don't care if he never goes to jail. I don't care if he plea bargains. I don't care if he rots in jail. I don't care if he's out tomorrow and he's drinking again. Let me tell you all what I did that night. I released him. And you know what I did? I recognized that in my releasing him, I had to trust God. God knew what that guy needed. God knew whether jail was going to change his life or not. I, I, here's the bottom line. I didn't care then. And that's a hard place to come. That's a very hard place to come. And that's why when we've been hurt so deeply, we need the help of God. We need faith. To let them go. Now it's interesting that Jesus talked about the sycamore, the sycamine tree. He says, "Say to the sycamore or sycamine tree, be cast into the sea." Why did he use the tree as an example? There's four reasons. Number one, the sycamore wood was used to build caskets. Perfect for caskets. Why? Because the wood was plentiful. Why? Because the wood drew, uh, grew in very dry conditions like it was in that region of the world in Jesus' time. It, it grew in, in very dry conditions and it grew very fast. So they proliferated. But see, that's how an offense is. That's how bitterness is. That, that it will grow very fast in you and it grows best in a spiritually dry condition. So if you're holding an offense and if you're holding unforgiveness and it's become a root of, of bitterness, then here's the question you have to ask yourself. Are you spiritually dry? Are you in tune with God? Are you making the most of your, your relationship with him? Because when you are dry, it's easy to be offended. There's lots of stuff to offend us, potentially. But here's the other thing. They made caskets out of it. So what are you putting caskets? Dead things dead people. See, an offense not handled, unforgiveness left unchecked, not dealt with, it'll kill you. Jesus understood that. So in that culture, they knew what he was talking about when he said, speak to that sycamore tree. Here's the second thing. The sycamore tree produced the fruit that was bitter to eat. So in other words, you couldn't take one and just throw it in your mouth. It was nasty. It was absolutely nasty. So what did you have to do? You had to nibble on it. Just a little tiny bite at a time because that's all you could stand. But you'd eventually eat the fruit because it was for nourishment. But here's the reality. That's how unforgiveness is. You nibble on the offense a little bit at a time until it becomes a mountain of thoughts that now direct your behavior, now controls your outcomes, control how you react and respond in situations. And the smallest little thing can set you off now. Why did he mention the sycamore tree? Because he understood this, that the sycamore tree could not reproduce until it was stung by a wasp. Wow. So the pollination was initiated by the sting of the wasp. Reproduction could only happen by the sting. It could only proliferate by pain. And have you ever been stung by somebody's words? See how offense comes in? You've been stung by their words. You've been stung by a situation. You've been stung in 
difficult places by people, circumstances, and things. And so now bitterness comes. It's a part of who you are. Here's the last reason why he said that the deep, uh, the, this, talked about the sycamore tree, because it has a deep root structure. What does that mean? It means that the roots of the sycamore tree go way, 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 way down into the ground. So you can chop it off and it's going to re-sprout. You cannot kill the sycamore tree. You ever had a situation in your life you thought you had dealt with something, then something happened, and you realized, dang, I hadn't dealt with that. Thought that you had released somebody, that you had forgiven them, but then when you saw the man, there was something that just stung you right in the pit of your gut, and all those feelings, all of those emotions surfaced again. See, all you did to the tree was you just clipped it. Just like on that video that we saw, guy clipping the plant. He did not solve his problem with that plant being in the wrong place at the wrong time until he did what? He uprooted it. He had to pull it out of the ground. Sycamore tree, the only way you can kill it, you have to uproot it. Unforgiveness and offense, the only way you can get rid of it, you have to kill it. So what did I say? The first way you're going to get free is you have to own it. You have to take heed to yourself. Number two, you need faith. Number three, how do you uproot this offense? You have to choose not to walk in. And I'm bringing it to a close now. You have to make a choice. It's a decision that I will not allow this offense to permeate my life. How is that? When we talk about scandalon, it's not the trap itself. Remember what I talked about? It's the triggering mechanism. So what is the triggering mechanism? His choice. Eve didn't get in trouble for talking to the serpent. Eve didn't get in trouble for looking at the fruit. Eve didn't get in trouble when she held the fruit. Eve got in trouble when she made the choice to disobey. Psh, there was a trap. Boom, it's set. Now we're in trouble. I'm going to tell you every single day you're going to have opportunity. You hear stuff on the news. You see stuff in politics. You, you hear about all this conflict in society. And I promise you every single day there's an opportunity for you to get offended by someone or something. And the triggering mechanism is your choice. What are you going to do with the information? What are you going to do with the offense when it comes? Are you going to embrace it? Or are you going to make a decision? I'm not letting that get near me. I'm not letting that come into my space. I'm going to have mercy on all the people who are acting stupid and saying crazy things. I'm going to forgive them quickly. That's what we do. So how do we get free? We look at it ourselves and we own it. We, we, we ask God to give us faith to overcome it. Then we, we make the right choice when we're presenting. Here's the last one. Open your mouth. Open your mouth. Matthew, the 12th chapter, verse 37, the message says this. Words are powerful. Take them seriously. Words can be your salvation. Words can also be your damnation. See, your words represent your authority. Your words have power. What happens when we take a bite of an apple and we didn't know it was rotten on the inside? Do you keep chewing? Oh, that apple's good. No, what do we do? We spit it out. I'm going to tell you that when the offense comes, it's like that, that rotten apple. What you have to do with your mouth, you have to reject it. You have to say, no, I'm not accepting that. When temptation comes my way, here's what I can tell you, that when it presents itself, a bad thought, a thought that's not pleasing to God, here's what I say to the thought. I reject that. I don't receive that. I want to stay in communion and relationship and fellowship with God. Go. And you know what temptation does and offense does? It disappears like a puff of smoke. When you open your mouth and say, nope, I reject it. I'm not getting mad at them. I'm not holding that against them. I want you to stand to your feet. So here's what happens. We begin to release the offense, the unforgiveness with our words. As we speak our words out, I release them. I let them go. I forgive them. I have mercy upon them. I pity them. As you do that, that seed, that root of bitterness can't stay in you. And you know why? Because the counter dope, the antidote to pride is humility. When you walk in humility, there's nothing can stand against you. Why? Because the word says, is God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. We're going to sing for just a moment. And why are we singing? Because I want you to just reflect on the word now. 
let the Lord massage your heart. And if there's something that you have in your heart that you've been offended by, and it's deep inside you, I want you in this time, in this moment, I want you to just say to the Lord, I'm turning this over to you right now. I want this out of me. I want it out of my mind. I want these feelings gone. I want it released, okay? So let's just go right into the presence of the Lord now. I just want to pray for you if maybe you have an offense. Maybe you have some unforgiveness in your heart. Maybe that offense led to unforgiveness and now there's a root of bitterness in your heart. I, I want... I want to pray for you, and I, I want us to make a declaration because we're going to spit the seeds of that offense out. We're going to do that with our, our declarations, with our profession, our confession. But with every head bowed and every eye closed, if you're in this place, you say, Pastor, I need to release, I need to release an offense. I need to let something go. Would you just raise your hand right now? Don't be embarrassed. All over this, this room right now, people are saying, I need to let some things go. Maybe it's your spouse you've got to let go. Maybe it's a friend that you got to let go. Maybe it's your parent. Maybe it's a system. Maybe you don't think that certain systems are just, and they offend you, and they've messed you up, and they got you thinking wrong. Come on, raise your hand real high one more time. Thank you. The online community, you're right where you are. Raise your hand. You can put your hand down now. I want you to say this with me. Say this. Say, Heavenly Father, I come to you now. I do not want offense in my life. I don't want it stealing my health. I don't want it stealing my peace. I don't want it stealing my heart. So help me now. Give me the faith to release the offender, whether it's a person or a situation or system, I release it now. I spit it out. Unforgiveness, you've got to go. Offense, you've got to go. I do not want you in my life. Be gone. In Jesus' name. Now, Lord, take that place where offense used to be and fill it with your presence. Fill it with your spirit. Fill it with your word. Fill that space with your peace. And I thank you for forgiving me as I've forgiven those who created the offense in my life. Amen. 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 Come on, let's give the Lord a hand. So here's what I want you to do this week. Walk offense free when the thoughts come about what has happened that transpired that really messed you up, just say, no, stop it right there. Not going any further. I've turned that over to the Lord. It's in his court now. Can I finish by telling y'all the end of the story about that letter from the DA's office? Next morning, I get on the phone. I call the DA's office and I said, hey, I got this letter. I, I need some, as Ricky Ricardo would say, I need some, some explaining. After about being on the phone and transferred from one person to another for the better part of 20 or 30 minutes, somebody came on the line and they said, uh, we don't know how you got the letter. Your case hasn't even been assigned to an attorney. It hasn't gone to a grand jury. And when they said that, I started laughing. And I pointed straight up to heaven and I said, God, you got me. Because until that letter came, I thought I was good in my heart. And if the letter had never come, I would have been deceived thinking I'd forgiven that guy. But I hadn't. So God used that letter to help me release an offense that I wasn't even aware of. Isn't God good? Let me tell you, he'll take our situations and our circumstances. He's going to turn them in our favor because our God is for us. Our God has great plans for us. Our God believes in us. And our God will see us through every situation and every circumstance. So as you go this week, go in confidence, go in strength, and go in power that your God is for you. God bless you. Have an awesome day.